that was an exhilarating time and one that I'll always remember. Uh, the, the briefing Joe asked me to give today is, was not the one that I gave that day. Uh, it was, it was uh, the one that a, a gentleman by the name of Morris Jenkins gave, who was one of my bosses at the time, uh, on, on, as Joe said, the software considerations and constraints, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, relative to the mission. Um, the one I gave that day was on uh, the return to Earth uh, abort analysis and planning. And uh, if time permits, I might uh, try to sneak a chart or two at the end of this from my briefing. Um, to uh, make this as uh, a faithful a recreation as possible, I'll uh, try to, or I'll at least attempt to use uh, present and future tenses instead of slipping into the past tense thing, which is difficult to do. And uh, uh, also, as, as you, you may have already noticed, because Morris was a, uh, an Englishman that, uh, uh, again, to further... Uh, recreate accurately that uh, that briefing is why I'm using a, a British accent today in, in, <laughs> instead of my my natural Texas draw and I'm going to continue to do that I mean, just, if I if I slip back into into my natural one just yell uh, uh, could I have the uh, first chart please In terms of the uh, overall uh, uh, mission software uh, considerations and, and, uh, and strategies, uh, as, I, as this chart shows, obviously they were driven by a, a combination of crew safety and, and mission success. But the other, other point was that it was, it, the strategy was to really have a partnership between the onboard and the ground. It was not just going to be the, the uh, onboard show for very, various reasons. Uh, as, as the uh, uh, first bullet indicates, of course, the onboard uh, software capability did have um, uh, plenty of, uh, of features that uh, ensured crew safety uh, as, as well as enhanced mission success. And uh, helping that uh, uh, capability was the uh, ability that it had to accept uh, uh, information from the ground, uplink from the ground during the mission. The, the ground uh, capability was actually uh, uh, prime and essential in, in certain cases. Uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, much of the navigation during the mission was prime from the ground, as, as well as a lot of the uh, uh, targeting, maneuver targeting. Uh, and, and likewise, the uh, ground provided uh, enhancement to mission success, as well as uh, served as a provider of various peripheral data like AC and LOS times, uh, lighting con predicted lighting conditions, and so on. And then there, uh, another part of the strategy was uh, when appropriate to, uh, to use combined uh, uh, onboard and ground software solutions uh, when, when so combining would enhance uh, crew safety or, or provide a more optimum uh, uh, resulting uh, mission plan or trajectory. Uh, have the next chart, please. Elaborating a little bit on the onboard's capability uh, relative to crew safety, it, it, the, the, the plan is to, I'll try to use present tense, the plan is, to, uh, is to, for the onboard to have an independent capability to return uh, in case to cover the obvious case of loss of communications from the ground when the ground cannot provide return to earth uh, targeting, maneuver targeting, and, and nav navigation uh, uh, support, then the onboard will have an independent capability to provide that. Now, in in uh, in uh, in actuality, what will happen? It, th even that turned out to be somewhat of a combination of onboard and ground because uh, uh, we ended up using what uh, was called advanced uh, block updates, where the ground would s would send it uh, return to earth solutions uh, for some future time, so that you lost calm between then and. Uh, and that future time, you would have a block update uh, maneuver to execute. Uh, it, it, uh, as I mentioned, it, it, the onboard will have the capability to accept ground updates. It will provide compatibility of software between the uh, uh, primary guidance system uh, and, the, and, the, and the LIM and the uh, abort guidance system, uh, as, uh, example being the compatibility of, of targeting for LIM ascent. 
It will provide a double check on relative state for rendezvous where the limb is uh, determining the relative state with its radar. The CSM is determining the relative state with sextant tracking of the limb. Um, and uh, also the capability will exist for the limb to direct a CSM active rendezvous. Uh, the, the solution would be computed on board the limb and voiced over to the uh, CSM where the CSM pilot would punch it in in the DISCI, the maneuver targeting information. Uh, and also the software will uh, provide uh, meaningful crew checks in, uh, in terms of the input and output data and display something that in, a, in a format that has some physical meaning to the crew wherever possible. In terms of mission success, of course, the, uh, the onboard uh, software will be providing the necessary steering or thrusting uh, uh, guidance programs. Uh, for translunar injection, though the Saturn will be pr uh, primed for translunar injection, be providing the, the uh, steering uh, using its iterative guidance for that uh, maneuver, the uh, uh, CSM uh, CMC computer will have uh, backup capability to uh, steer translunar injection if for some reason the, uh, there's a loss of capability for the Saturn to uh, guide through translunar injection. And as I mentioned there, uh, uh, the onboard will have the ability to accept alternate targeting from the ground to provide more optimum solutions. Next chart, please. The basic onboard uh, GNN software capability is uh, described on these charts. Uh, there are four classes of, uh, of uh, programs uh, proposed for onboard. Uh, the navigation class, where you have observations, uh, nav observations fed into a trajectory determination processor, uh, outputting, which it would then output uh, after it does its thing, the current smooth position and velocity determination. Uh, answering the question, where are we? And to answer the question, where will we be? We have the class called dead reckoning. That was one of Morris's favorite terms. I call it trajectory prediction. He calls it dead reckoning. But it, it, it involves uh, taking an ephemeris or a state vector input into a trajectory prediction uh, uh, processor and, uh, and outputting the best estimate of future position and velocity. And, and uh, you also had the pre-thrust programs which would essentially determine the uh, uh, change of course required coming out with the target objectives for the thrust programs. Uh, this is where the targeting was set up and configured to tell the steering uh, uh, thrust programs what to steer to. Then you, you did have finally have, the, for the purpose of maneuver control, you had the thrust programs themselves, which uh, 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 included the uh, steering equations to achieve the uh, desired target conditions, and including the achievement of the desired cutoff conditions. Uh, elaborating on that just a second, the uh, trajectory determination processor, uh, uh, the basic component there was a Cal uh, is proposed to be a Kalman filter, which, which will uh, filter out uh, noise in the, uh, be a mathematical formulation to filter out uh, noise in the uh, measurement data, as well as uh, provide the capability to solve for uncertainties in the di various dynamic models, uh, primarily the gravity model. Uh, trajectory uh, prediction processor uh, will feature the Inky method of numerical integration. For you numerical integration buffs, uh, you all know what the Inky method is. It's uh, where you do a numerical integration instead of in the equations of motion in totality, you just uh, numerically integrate the deltas from a base two closed form two body solution. Uh, so that you, and, and uh, our studies up to this time show that uh, will provide a uh, superior accuracy or superior speed, same accuracy if you want to take larger steps. The pre-thrust programs, uh, as I mentioned, set up the, uh, the, the targeting. They uh, provide, determine the uh, initial thrust uh, command attitude and determine the preferred uh, platform alignment. The thrust programs uh, include the um, MIT's um, uh, cross-product steering, which is a uh, simple but reliable uh, uh, steering law, which uh, essentially requires the, the uh, cycle-to-cycle -cycle determination of a, of a uh, close form velocity to be gained, uh, which is kept, that velocity be gained uh, vector is kept inertially fixed and the steering law shrinks its values as you go through the burn. The e-guidance is a more sophisticated guidance law for when you're trying to control more parameters uh, such as be required for the limb ascent and descent. Then you got the local vertical coordinate or external delta V 
steering law where you're actually thrusting along local horizontal or out of plane coordinates. Uh, next chart, please. Uh, because of the capacity limitations uh, in the onboard computer and the schedule limitations, uh, how much schedule time we've got to, uh, to uh, implement the requirements in the onboard computer, there will be uh, uh, significant omissions that we will not be able to get into the onboard computer. The, the self-checking will be restricted. The logic to avoid gimbal lock will not be included. Uh, there will be no concentric sequence logic uh, automated in the CMC, as I mentioned earlier, for the CS CSM uh, active rendezvous. They have to get that, uh, that uh, maneuver targeting and planning uh, from the limb uh, or the ground. The, uh, there will be an abs no flight plan prediction or optimization capability, no point return back to Earth. It will have return to Earth capability, but no ability to return to a specific point on the Earth. And uh, as I said, there will be no uh, sophisticated iterative steerings uh, uh, like the Marshall uh, guidance for translunar injection. Instead, the, the more simple cross-product steering will be used. And next slide, please. As regards to the ground, uh, supplementary and backup uh, functions, uh, uh, many, uh, if not most, of the, the target determinations will be uh, uh, done on the ground and, and uplinked. They will also provide um, uh, pilot monitoring information for manual maneuvers, uh, and they will provide, especially for contingency situations, uh, much more extensive uh, flight planning optimization, real-time mission planning uh, function, and it will also provide an umpiring function between the uh, pings and ags, it, especially as regards uh, range rate information to assist the limb in uh, Ascent switch over monitoring, navigation, and the ever present dead reckoning down here. Uh, next chart, please. Uh, at this point in Morris's uh, presentation, he went into about an hour and a half discussion of the various uh, targeting techniques to be used. And I've just selected uh, 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 three or four of them to give you a, a sampling. Uh, uh, Morris was a targeting junkie, and he, he, he loved it. and he taught me to love it also. Uh, type 1 targeting uh, uh, was for translunar injection, and this was to uh, target the uh, uh, translunar steering for the, uh, if the CSM was going to be doing it instead of the uh, uh, Saturn. So it had to be a very simple closed form uh, way of computing a velocity be gained. So what you did, you t from the pre-flight pre plan that uh, that Pete was talking about, you'd pick off uh, near the uh, 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 Saturn uh, cutoff vector, you'd pick off a state vector, uh, de uh, de determine a uh, conic ellipse, pick off a position vector from that, uh, that with the energy uh, of, the, of the ellipse. And, and by the way, Pete's uh, depiction of the ellipse was much more accurate than Mars's. Uh, Mars showed it a little short on the semi-major axis. It really went way out like that, like Pete showed. Uh, but you, uh, with the uh, position vector and the energy of this ellipse, that uh, together with the uh, a, uh, a position vector in real time, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of the translunar injection, is all you need to define that conic, and therefore define a velocity gained uh, in a in a cyclical uh, uh, sense to uh, supply the uh, uh, velocity gained to the cross product steering. Uh, the targeting type one also was used for lunar orbit insertion, uh, with the only uh, additional wrinkle that the uh, the target uh, position was constrained to be the same uh, length as the current position, so that you were forcing it to burn into a circular orbit. Next chart, please. The type two targeting. Uh, uh, was used for the uh, translunar mid-courses. Uh, again, you, they were conic-based. Uh, this is uh, a little too complicated because I'm about to run out of time. Uh, but you uh, essentially take a, uh, a uh, the, the pre, again, the pre-flight computed uh, translunar trajectory. Note where it uh, punctures or pierces the lunar sphere of influence at time two or point two. Uh, now you're on a dis in real time. You're on a dispersed trajectory at, at time or point T1. You uh, precision integrate where you're going to end up at the same time as T2. Call that T3. 
you compute a conic trajectory between T1 and, and T3 at the, uh, at the same delta time as between T1 and, and, and T2. You then compute another conic trajectory between T1 and T2 to compute the VG, apply it to precision trajectory, and voila, you hit that point if all goes well. Also, I'd like to put uh, one, uh, one long-standing myth to rest once and for all uh, that, that when we did fly the actual missions uh, and, and punctured the sphere of influence, there was not an audible pop. <laughs> it was a low hiss. And <laughs> so the targeting type two is also used with a little different wrinkle for the uh, second and third mid-course corrections inside the lunar sphere of influence approaching the moon. I'm not going to have time to go into the details of that. Next chart, please. And targeting type three is even uh, more interesting, but, uh, and because I won't even have time to begin here, but essentially, again, it's conic-based, but here you have uh, the conic centered uh, both at the Earth to consider as well as the conic at the moon, hyperbola here, ellipse here. You iterate the two until you match them up at the uh, sphere of influence in terms of the energy and position, and then once you get a match on the conics, then you go through the same procedure with precision, uh, backtracking precision back to the lunar sphere of influence, forward until you match at the uh, sphere of influence. And the last chart, uh, back up one, number one. I'm going to sneak in one from my pitch. No, uh, go to the next one. Back up number one. There we go. Uh, this is one of the most fun things I ever did. Uh, it involved uh, doing lunar, uh, doing return to Earth uh, board analysis from the family of trajectories resulting from a premature LOI shutdown. In other words, if you're burning into lunar orbit and you had to be able to uh, recover from a premature shutdown at any time in the uh, burn. You ended up having to analyze a, uh, this is a trajectory analyst dream, by the way. You ended up having to analyze uh, a whole family of trajectories ranging from escape hyperbolas to ellipses to circular orbits to even these weird unstable ones which start out retrograde relative to the moon, come down and, and change, become, come back posigrade coupled with the fact you were trying to, uh, you had nearly an infinite number of uh, maneuver possibilities to play with to figure out how to best recover from both time critical and non-time critical situations. Uh, that was fun. And that concludes my talk. Any questions? We have one question here. Yes. Was there similar analysis to the one Ron just showed for the translunar injection burn? Yes, there was. You get the, a similar family there, and also for the trans-Earth injection burn, you get a similar family. The, the one for TLI had the interesting properties, somewhat different from the, the lunar ones, but they were interesting also. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Doug Broom, who was in the Apollo spacecraft program office in 1966 and who is now at NASA headquarters in the Office of Space Science and Applications, and he will discuss the communication systems which we used. Doug? The key word was that I was, I'm in NASA headquarters. That's why the 10 key charts I needed today are missing. Uh, um, things haven't changed much since I worked here. Uh, Owen, the first time Owen gave that, Owen Maynard, the elderly gentleman here, am I right? The first time that he gave the uh, presentation on constraints was interesting. He had an overlay of the moon, and he would flip an overlay. For each set of constraints, he'd flip an overlay that blacked in part of the moon. And he got down to his last constraint, and he flipped it over, and the screen was entirely black. And he says, gentlemen, we cannot go to the moon. <laughs> okay. So he's too old to remember that sort of thing. But um, Owen and I are related. He's my grandfather. Uh, since I'm from headquarters, I'll take the opportunity to give you a commercial. I'm also the program manager for the Hubble Space Telescope. And if God will quiet the sun and Aaron Cohen will give us a, an STS in March, we're going to put it in orbit. And it'll be the greatest thing we've done since we landed on the moon. How's that? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm going to have to play with the charts a little bit since they're not the ones I was looking for, but um, communications with a spacecraft is a lot like your relationship with your mother. You know, your mother never wants to let go of control, whereas you always know that you can handle any problem that comes into your life and you don't need control from your mother. The flight crews are pretty independent. They think they can handle any emergency, but the ground never wants to let them out of sight, out of mind, out of control. So that leads to a problem with communications. Okay, and the, the, the thing that we had, we had multiple problems going. One was that particular problem. That particular problem was manifested because in the fact that there were a large suite of things that already existed, and we were stuck with trying to live with what we had, and at the same time minimize power and weight requirements on a spacecraft. So we'd finished the Mercury program, started the Gemini program, and everything in those programs was done at HF, VHF, or UHF, none of which would work at the moon. The uh, Deep Space Network at JPL it was operating at about 980, as I recall, megahertz, and was moving over to S-Ban. And uh, they had the only systems that would operate at the kind of distances we needed. So our problem was we needed to operate from here to the pad, which turned out to be fairly difficult. And then from the pad to Earth orbit, then Earth orbit to translunar, and then from, from uh, the Earth to, uh, trans, to the lunar surface. Then on the lunar surface, you've got two guys out, you've got a guy orbiting the spacecraft, you've got people on the ground, you've got a television set or camera, you've got all these different ways, and the links all have to somehow work together to get back down to a TV screen here at Mission Control and in the, in the general public. So what we wound up with was one of everything. Uh, we had an HF system, a VHF systems, we had uh, UHF systems, and we had S-band systems. And ultimately, if we'd kept flying, I think we would have gotten around to just the S-band system, which was the ultimate goal. The goal was to go from the transition period of all the different frequencies to the S-band system, which would be a single unified system. At the same time, there were other transitions going on. We had, uh, we had the transition, if I can find where I wrote that. We had to transition from, digit, from analog to digital systems. You know, everything at one time, uh, if anybody else is this old in the room, everything at one time was done at analog. You had two cycle per second bandwidth telemeter channels, things like that. Uh, the, uh, everything, all the circuit designs were done in analog. One way of dealing with analog was you over-design everything and you put buffers in and as the system degrades, you still get an adequate signal out. The, uh, the other way was design it where it worked right in the first place and then it would just degrade. And, uh, <laughs> That was a lot of the block one command and service module system. Uh, so let's see, there was a third, there was a, th a third integration going on, and I don't recall what it was. Okay, the television. In case you've heard that there was a very systematic approach to putting television on the on the spacecraft, you're wrong. Uh, there had been an experiment. I guess it was Gemini. We did the line scan thing. It looked terrible. The Russians had put up television, so we tried, and it looked terrible. And uh, some of the somebody was talking about the giants of the space industry had decided never to be that embarrassed again. And um, so we worked a plan. George Miller did not want television on Apollo, so he would, he would say no and we'd say yes, but he never told us to quit, so we kept building the communication system to ta handle color television. And each, every other month or so, I'd go with this group up to Washington and I got to give the presentation on color television because I was youngest, and if I got fired, I was the most expendable. <laughs> and um, so we finally decided that this time we were going to take the big guns. Werner von Braun himself was going to say that television was required for Apollo to maximize the political of everything of the program. But Werner dozed off while I was giving my pitch. <laughs> and um, I do that now. And, but fortunately, Sam Phillips was sitting behind him, and Sam knew the criticality of this decision because we had already installed the camera. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> JSC operated no differently then than it does now. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I started working my way towards where Werner was sitting, swinging the pointer against my leg, and Sam caught what I was about to do. So he leaned forward, and when I popped the table in front of Werner and woke him up, Sam said, television, television. <laughs> <laughs> and Werner says, oh, yes, if I think we must go to the moon with color television, it is what the people of America have paid for. And then he dozed back off. <laughs> so... That is how, in his British accent, we got television on Apollo. Okay, uh, let me have the first two view graphs, please. Now you see why they sent me to headquarters. Uh, these are the these are the kind of things we were trying to do, and I've been over them a bit. Uh, voice telemetry we had two rates: uh, ranging, tracking, up data, voice and data playback, television data, and television had to be from a command module, had to be from the lunar surface. So that brought us multiple sets of problems. And then there was a science bay in the uh, service module that we put in at one point, and there was a science package left on the moon, so that was two more links. 
Then you had uh, VHF voice. The reason for this is, you know, you had airplanes around the world that were equipped for a VHF recovery for military purposes and for HF. So we had to carry those because we weren't sure. We didn't know much about what we we're going to do with Apollo, regardless of what these folks say. And we weren't quite sure where it was going to come down sometimes. So we had to make sure that somebody somewhere could find it. And uh, that was the reason for the HF, for example. HF, you know, if it bounces long enough, somebody will hear it. And the ultimate goal, of course, is to home in on that and find out where the spacecraft was. And that's why they all went down to, the astronauts all went down to Canal Zone and learned to eat rattlesnake and boa constrictor and things like that. That was their level of confidence in what we were going to do for them. <laughs> okay. so, the, uh, the problem, of course, you know, the Mercury network, which was in the Gemini network, were all these stations around the world. And as I said, they had the VHF and UHF systems. Next few graphs, please. Now, this is where you're going to have to use your imagination because there were five view graphs in this set. Okay, pretend that's the Earth. Uh, the, see, the, real, the problem here is this is the most complex. You've got two astronauts. They have to be able to talk to each other, and they want to talk in duplex. So that if something goes on, you don't have one yammer jaw. That, similar to Owen's presentation, you know, that you just can't shut them up and get a word in. <laughs> and um, then you want to be able to communicate through the lunar module, then translate over to S-band and go to the Earth, same time you've got the command service module. At the time, there was no S-band no frequency domain set aside for uh, deep space communications. And that activity had to go on in parallel. And there was an international body that, that we never were quite sure was going to say we could do this while we were building all the equipment. And towards the end, they finally approved it, and we were able to use it. Uh, when, envision the fact that you're near Earth, and now this is a command and service module. You're near Earth. You've got these communication links with the Earth. There's a, a lot of, the, the problem with communication became one of management. Everything had to be multiply switched, and then it was a big, long procedural thing you had to go through to make sure that nobody threw the wrong switch at the wrong time, because you had a very complex system of relays with backups. And the problem with any system that's very flexible is then you have to come along and constrain it later to make it work the way it's, the way, to make it work at all, let alone the way it was supposed to. So uh, it, I don't recall, except for the communications between the blockhouse and the pad, I don't recall ever having a communication problem. There was a serious problem there for other reasons. Now, when we were looking at, I think it was Apollo 15 rover first time around. I think it was Apollo 15. It became obvious the rover was going to go a little too far out. So communication packages were added to the, um, to the rover itself that you could relay EVA through. And um, Joe, I see Joe McKenzie back there. He participated in that development. It's a lunar communication relay unit. Then it dawned on somebody who also needed television for that. So you put the camera on the front end of the rover, and then it relayed through the L, L crew or whatever they called it. And um, that gave the link then directly from the rover to Earth. So you had a communication link from the command module circling the moon to the Earth, communication link from the lunar module sitting on the moon to the Earth, and a communication link from the rover to the moon sitting on the Earth, Low, rover to the Earth sitting on the moon. So it was, very, it was a, a complex system and um, almost, uh, well, I think I'll stop at that. What's the next, next chart, please? Um, the, as I said, the frequencies we're talking about here, the, the S-band system for lunar module and command module, they was where the, as I recall, it was a 228 to 230 ratio between transmit and receive, or the other way around. The, um, this number, in the interest of accuracy, my light doesn't work yet. No. That number is 2106.40625. See, some of us never forget anything. Uh, that's the way you do the space station budget, is that many decimals. Uh, the down link is the, uh, was 2287.5, and that was a coherent link with the up link. And you'll notice over here, if you do the calculations, if you care about it, they're the same ratio. And we also had an additional down link from the command module for stored data. Uh, the antenna system was a rather complex system, and there were multiple power levels that were available. Also, the antenna, the high-gain antenna, had multiple switching so that the crew wouldn't have to bother with trying to point it. It could lock up on the Earth. It just, it, uh, as it moved out, it would get to compensate for the loss of signal due to longer distance. It also would switch down and increase the, uh, decrease the uh, beam width and therefore increase the gain of the antenna. So it was a rather neat transition from the Earth to the Moon. Uh, next, please. For the CSM systems, which our ultimate goal was to drop the VHF system, but, uh, and I suspect that was done with the uh, shuttle. I went off to become a private detective and never checked back. The, uh, Let's see, five watts uh, was the power on those, and there were omni antennas on both spacecraft. We had, but again, because of the uh, fact that you had to break the command module from the service module during reentry, we had to have multiple sets of antennas there also. Next few guys, please. The, then for recovery, uh, we had high frequency system at 10.006 megacycles. We took that off in block two, and it was a fortunate move. 
because it left a coal plate in the Block II spacecraft that was unoccupied. And it occurred to somebody at one point that uh, the lunar module had a, a rendezvous radar it could use to find the command and service module, but there was a problem that if you got to a safe, low altitude aboard with the lunar module, there was no way for the command module to come down and find the lunar module. So the uh, question was, how could we modify the system we had since we were uh, going to launch Apollo 8 fairly soon? We, had, we were given 13 and a half months to develop some system. We took that coal plate, put a digital range, rate, range and range rate system on it, and used some spare wires in the GNC harness to uh, give a range and range rate capability to the voice system within the command module. So the, you used range and range rate and the optical sight in the command module to find the lunar module. So for 15 million here, you got the equivalent of, what, the $100 million rendezvous radar and lunar module. And a little commercial there, too. Uh, we used to have two divisions, a command module division and a lunar module division. The lunar module division wasn't as smart as the command module division. <laughs> okay, um, then from the moon, I get to say that since they're not here. Then from the moon, uh, we had this separate package at 2119, and uh, those transmitted for quite a long time when they got out to the, uh, to the uh, nuclear powered systems. And I was told I had one minute, so I'll quit. I'll be the only guy up here who did this on time. Any questions? <laughs> Besides the fact that I don't have to get fired. <laughs> Is that it? That's, that's so somebody. Uh, uh, is that legal? The question is, <laughs> could you tell us a little more about the scientist Hubble, after whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named? We're getting a second commercial. Okay. Edwin Hubble was a guy who finished high school and became, was going to be a professional football player, and instead World War I came along and he volunteered and got shot to pieces and decided he couldn't be a football player. So he went back to college and became a uh, lawyer. He got bored with law and he went back to college and became an astronomer. Uh, after he went into the astronomical business, he noticed that, uh, that there was some motion that, that other people weren't reporting in the, um, it, with, with what they were seeing in photographic plates. And he came up with the idea that there was a rate at which stars were moving away from us, and that rate was a function of the distance away. And uh, that gives rise to the term the Hubble constant. The Hubble constant was, he misestimated a little bit for the, for the techniques he had, he was very accurate. And that is an argument over whether he's 100% off or he's right on. But what that tells us is that the universe is indefinitely expanding. The issue then becomes, is it, is it expanding to a point at which it will, it will go to equilibrium and stay? Is it expanding to a point where it will continue to expand forever? Or is it expanding to a point in which it will stop and then collapse on itself? And that's vitally important to us since it may happen in two billion years. And that'll be called, you've heard of the Big Bang, that'll be called a Big Crunch. And that, that is the, the name for it, the jargon name for it. But the, uh, the key is that um, Hubble, Hubble was, a, was a guy who really discovered the fact that the universe was not a static thing, that it was not just sitting here and that we were not one element and, and the universe was that little thing we can go lay on our back in the grass and see. Uh, that in fact it just goes on and on and on. And the purpose of the Hubble t t Space Telescope is number one, to better evaluate the um, Hubble constant and give us a better feel for the age of the universe and what's going on with it. Other things it'll do is determine the formation of the earliest galaxies, uh, the earliest galaxies that we expect to be able to see some 15 billion years back in time. And if we can do that, we can confirm or not confirm a number of the theories of how the universe developed from the Big Bang. Thank you very much, Doug. <laughs> I think you can understand why communications is his forte. <laughs> our next speaker is Ken Cox, who is currently the chief of our avionics systems division, and he will discuss the onboard guidance, navigation, and control systems of the Apollo program. Uh, thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, I was going to state first that uh, I had a uh, cataract operation less than a week ago, so you may see a one-eyed presentation here. Okay. But uh, the doctor told me to stay away from bright lights. <laughs> oh, dear. And I didn't, I didn't realize this. But anyway, if I squint, uh, th there's a reason. Uh, when I went through the uh, uh, guidance, nav, and control from a uh, command service module, CSM, and from a lunar module, uh, it brought back the fact that there are a hell of a lot of acronyms that I had forgotten. And uh, it took a while to start picking some of them back up. 
I would like to I would like to say this, that I'd like to give appreciation to the fact that uh, Norm Sears and, and Russ Larson from Draper Lab helped me put this presentation together. And uh, back in the Apollo days 20 years ago, it was called MIT Instrumentation Lab. And they had a major responsibility as far as the development of the onboard uh, uh, guidance nav and control. Let me go to the first uh, next, next slide, please. Okay, what I intended to do was to, was to religiously follow the assignment given called How Did We Get There? But I quickly decided I had enough material that I couldn't explain how we got back. Okay, and I followed, I followed your, your uh, instructions, Joe. Uh, what I want to do is uh, I've got about, um, oh, seven or eight slides just to talk off of, and I wanted to avoid uh, giving you equations of motion or detailed descriptions of hardware and try as I go to give you some of the human element because it, it, it's really interesting if you were involved in a project like this, many of the things that, that, that have happened. Uh, I'll talk about the lunar landing mission phases, but because Ron Berry and some others have preceded me, I'll skip over that rather quickly. And then uh, describe what the equipment was on the lunar module and the command module. And what I decided to do was um, I asked myself, well, what were some of the really significant uh, operational and technical events that happened on the way to the moon where uh, I would finish my particular cycle as far as once the lunar module touched down on the moon. And I came up with four areas that I thought were, were important in the uh, guidance nav and control area. Uh, one was the fact that uh, the onboard uh, spacecraft with the uh, scanning telescope and the sextant had the capability to do autonomous nav. Now, as, you, as, as previous speakers have talked about, uh, the, ground, the ground system was the primary system, but there was the capability that if for some reason the communications gave out, was there some way to get back self-contained? And that capability was built in. Uh, the second uh, item that I will discuss uh, in a little bit of detail is the fact that, uh, like uh, Doug just mentioned, Doug Bloom, uh, in the control area, we went through this uh, analog to digital conversion right in the middle of the uh, project. And we ended up that for Gemini and, and Mercury, the previous spacecraft, there were analog autopilots, uh, analog feedback systems, and uh, that's the way it started out on the Apollo program. Uh, North American was responsible for the uh, command service module, and they had an analog uh, SCS system, stabilization and control system. Grumman was responsible for the analog uh, flight control system or analog autopilot for the lunar module. And we went through what we call a block two exercise and decided to go with digital control systems, and it was a fairly significant decision at the time. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk today is more of the... Uh, a primary system as opposed to the backups. The third significant event that, that I'll talk about is that uh, I went back and reviewed a lot of the work and without a doubt the final powered flight phase of the lunar module descent propulsion system where we were headed toward the moon but with the with the big engine on if you will uh, and how that got developed was indeed a, a, a significant contribution. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, uh, you get showed an awful lot of equipment, but uh, how the crew, how the astronauts worked with the guidance nav and control system, uh, uh, and how that uh, uh, interface was developed between the man and the machine was really a challenging uh, uh, area and many many people have contributed as far as the work that went on okay next chart all right I think I'll go through this one rather quickly um, I've got the the mission phases here but most of what I'll talk about today start from say the uh, translunar injection where we actually get out of the orbit of the uh, Earth where the Saturn has taken us and we're headed toward the moon and as we head that way in general there were either two or three mid-course corrections that were planned as I, as I recall, translunar corrections. Uh, 
once we get into the lunar uh, orbit uh, with a um, LOI, lunar orbit injection, which I think has been talked about also, um, then we're around the moon in a certain time period, and at the bottom uh, is, a, is a picture that shows uh, uh, going down where uh, once the lunar module, the LEM, and the command service module decouple and the command service module stays in orbit around the moon. Uh, the lunar module has an injection, a slight burn, and then it coasts for a long time, and then we finally get to the final powered flight landing that I'll talk about in more detail. And that's where I'll stop as far as any comments on the um, guidance nav and control system. Now, there's an awful lot of work as far as what did we do to, to design the control system when you lift off from the moon for the ascent and the rendezvous that went on and so forth, and coming all the way back to Earth and, and reentry and so forth, but I won't cover that area. Okay, next chart. Uh, this just tries to show what some of the major equipment was for the uh, onboard system. In this case, we're talking about the command module or the command service module, really. Um, and it turns out that the optics, which gave us some of the autonomous navigation capability, consisted of a, a scanning telescope and a sextant. And uh, the functions of aligning the platform, um, which was a, a three gimbal platform, uh, using the, the optics was part of the function as well as uh, navigation sightings. Um, the computer, um, I think I heard Ron say that there were not enough memory, but when we started the project, I think we started with 24K memory and we eventually went up to 36, and 36 was a lot of memory, right? And surely we wouldn't run out. Wrong. We went through the Black Friday, as, as Ron said, and cut all those elements out that had been developed and so forth. And uh, uh, just to show that history, we always learn, you know, we went to the same thing on the shuttle, and we ended up with uh, 64K, so surely that would have been enough for the shuttle, and that was before we doubled the 